welcome back to my channel. Um, I've, I've had quite a morning um, with my support worker earlier on. We made um, coconut and pineapple muffins um, from my new uh, Cook's Corner little book of muffin recipes that I got from the Works discount store in the UK. It's for Works. If you're in UK, if you're not in the UK, the Works is basically a discount store where you can just get lots of odds and ends for sort of reasonable prices. Um, so yeah, we made coconut and pineapple muffins, which are really nice. Um, I might run through the recipe another time, possibly, we'll see. If you want that, do let me know in the comments box below. Um, but yeah, we had it with um, Greek yoghurt, and I mixed the Greek yoghurt up with desiccated coconut and put them on top, a bit like icing, with extra pineapple, um, which worked really, really well. That's a, that's a, that's a good tip, actually. Um, if you want to make healthy icing, instead of using butter, get some Greek yoghurt and uh, whip up an icing with that, it's so nice. So yeah, um, had two muffins each, I put the rest in the freezer, but I've got one for tomorrow as well. And then I had jacket potato and tuna mayonnaise um, as we gone for lunch, so I am stuffed. So literally, um, late afternoon lethargy, I'm like, <laughs> like, I've literally eaten so much this morning. <laughs> um, okay, so in today's video, um, I wanted to review uh, this book here, which I got from the library. Um, it's another autism autobiography um, <laughs> called uh, Keep Clear, My Adventures with Asperger's by um, Tom Cutler. So um, it's a book I read recently because I quite I like reading autism autobiographies because <laughs> it's just interesting, you know, sort of like finding out about other people's experiences um, living with autism. Um, so I took some notes. So I'm just going to like run through really. Good, good, good book, good gist of a book. Um, so it's essentially a memoir. Um, Tom Cutler, the author, um, has Asperger's, or it used to be called Asperger's before he got rid of Asperger's from the DSM, but um, he, he still identifies as having Asperger's, as many people still do. Um, and um, he was diagnosed quite late in life, um, in his 50s. Um, he lives in the UK, he's married, um, he's got a son, um, he's got some... He got, and, he um, lived quite a kind of like integrated life, like, you know, he had many jobs and everything, kind of blended in society pretty well. But underneath all of that, he had a lot of anxiety, which he wasn't aware of at the time. Um, <laughs> he, it all came to a head, really, um, when he basically, I guess, all this anxiety was like brewing inside. And um, he one day he had like a panic attack where he woke up sweating, his heart racing in the early hours. He felt really unwell and that he was going to die. Um, I can completely relate, relate to that because this, that, the same sort of thing has happened to me too. Thankfully not that often, but um, I have had a couple of occasions where I have woken up. I, I think they call them night terrors, but basically woken up, you know, like with your heart pounding sweating and you literally think you're having a heart attack and you're basically going to die um in actual fact when it happened to me the first time round, i was convinced i was going to die so i actually went to the doctors because i had like really bad health anxiety and they did all these tests and they're like no you're really healthy there's nothing wrong with you physically and they just said it's just anxiety which i now i'm more aware that it is anxiety but even when it happens i still think i'm going to die even now i know no that i've been given the kind of the health, the MOT of health, as it were, and I, I'm not going to die, but I still get that feeling that I am because when it happened to me, I literally did not know that it was it was panic or anything like that. Like, um, and actually, even now, I've been told people have told me that it's panic. Even when it happens now, thankfully, I said it doesn't happen too often, but when it does happen, I still I can't really relate to it as being panic because to me, panic attacks are what happened to other people, and like, I don't know, I still don't understand it, and I, I can relate to that because when it's happened to Tom. He also thought he was going to die, like literally thought he was going to die. Um, and he, health actually happened to be a special interest of his, um, which I, I think fueled that anxiety. And also like, I guess I also, health was a special interest of mine as well for some time. And then when you read a lot about health and then you get into your head that you have something really badly wrong with you and, um, and that can then fuel health anxiety because obviously some of the symptoms of anxiety um, can also be symptoms of like serious physical diseases as well and if you're an anxious person you tend to kind of like jump to conclusions and that's why like I said I once went to the doctors like loads of time for reassurance um, uh, before I realised what was going on I'm a little bit better at understanding it now but I still don't understand it 100% and I still sometimes like do worry still a lot 
um, because you know, particularly in a moment, you know, you, you jump to conclusions if you're an anxious person. But um, so yeah, so he woke up his wife. He told him he was having a panic attack. Um, panic attack? Me? Don't be ridiculous. Um, that's kind of like what I was. I, I felt as well because I don't quite understand it. When people say panic, I'm like, hmm? don't know what you're going on about because. I don't know, I just don't quite identify with it. So I don't know. I guess because like I, I really struggle to understand feelings and I think Tom has a similar problem, like understanding emotions and understanding feelings just doesn't come naturally. I, I don't I so yeah, let me know what you think as well about this. Um so yeah, so he had all of these symptoms, trembling, rapid breathing, feeling of impending doom, racing heart, hot and cold flushes, pins and needles, lightheadedness, sweating, nausea tearfulness, a feelings of reality, unreality or detachment. So he all symptoms of a panic attack, which um, he googled afterwards. Um, and yeah, and he, he had a lot. But like I say, he didn't put two and two together. And like I said, I can relate to that 100% because I didn't either. And even when it happens to me now, I still don't really get it. But yeah, when he went to the doctor, the doctor told him that he had anxiety, which is similar to what happened to me. <laughs> I went to the doctor, terrified I was going to die. And they did all these tests. They're like, no, it's just anxiety. You're absolutely fine physically. It's just anxiety. Um, so he was told to go and read up about anxiety, which he did. Um, and, yeah, and he, so he read up on anxiety and he realised he ticks the box for social anxiety. And he used alcohol before any social gathering to blunt fear and make him more able to join in. And I've actually read that that is quite a common coping strategy for quite a number of autistics. I've never done that because I don't drink, because I don't like alcohol. Um, I'm teetotal, but I have heard that quite a few autistics do use alcohol to drink, to cope. Not just autistics, but even like non-autistics, particularly like introverted types often do that as well. So let me know what you think about that in the box below. Um, personally, I don't really have social anxiety. I don't have social phobia. I think some of my symptoms can sometimes look like that. But um, I don't have, so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not a shy person. So I don't really get any real social phobia or anxiety when I'm in social situations as such. I mean, obviously I do get to it to some extent, but not to a debilitating extent. You know, I'm more than, I'm quite able to kind of like, you know, talk and stuff like that, you know. I think when I was younger, when I was at school, I had more, kind of more of that, but Again, I'm not sure, I think quite a lot of it was actually more the fact I was overwhelmed and, and I didn't really quite understand, so it came across that way, but I think for me it's more just like social awkwardness. But um, Tom definitely says he identifies with having social anxiety, um, and he always found parties really difficult, which he dreaded days ahead, for as long as he can recall. He says that he feels like there's an invisible um, force field uh, between him and others at parties, separating him from them, and, he, and it feels unable unable to break in, um, uncomprehending at age, feeling resentful, I can completely relate to all of that, that's exactly, it feels like it's invisible force field, I thought that was really well put, um, and yeah, he also ticked off generalised anxiety disorder, which means that you're anxious most of the time about a whole range of things, I could not remember when he last felt relaxed, I'm pretty certain I have that one, um, I don't think I'm socially anxious, but I definitely t identify with a generalised anxiety disorder one, um, because, yeah, that kind of explains it. I'm anxious all the time, so I think that's definitely it as well. Um, so, yeah, and like, um, another thing I can relate to is that, like me, he's very good with words. Um, words, this is kind of like strength. Um, he, he's actually a writer. That's his main, like, profession. Um, he writes in his attic after his morning walk. Every day he writes from 8.30am. He has a very strict writing routine. Um... So, yeah, he also talks a little bit about masking and how um, he gets tense before social occasions. For example, going out to dinner in three weeks with friends. Um, he, he finds out he can manage, one person he can manage, and, but two, three is exhausting and that's completely it with me as well. Um, he says he could say no, but it's not fair on his wife and he wants to fit in. So he does mask and he does try and blend in. He says that he's learned over the years to imitate what other people do in social situations. He's always pretending to like it, even though he doesn't. Uh, he goes, so he sees a therapist because of his anxiety. He's referred to a therapist. <laughs> um, and he, so he has cognitive behavioural therapy. And at the end of the therapy... Um, the therapist said that she'd be thinking about his first session when he had told her in great detail about his objections to the CBT online sunburst website. Um, he'd been very overly critical and quite pedantic about it. And she'd been wondering, have we got something else going on here? Also, 
his points about social problems and his special interest in road signs, a very stereotypical autistic interest, that one. In one session, you talked at length about London Tube Map. It's a diagram, really, not a map, I said. I'm just quoting from a book. Fair, you're a details man and rules man, definitions, commas, errors. Gafer has then said she thought he might be autistic. Now, this made me wonder this little bit. It made me wonder if she would have come to the same conclusion if his interests were less stereotypical, because, like, he does display some very what you think of as like stereotypical autistic interest, you know, like things like road signs, um, car number plates, which are often said to be quite stereotypically autistic interests. I think they're possibly more common among men with autism, although that is a generalisation. But I'm just wondering if the therapist was faced with a woman, a bit like me, um, with the same, similar issues, you know, like social problems and stuff, but whose interests are obviously just as intense and highly focused, but like more, not as kind of like, Idiot, I don't know, not quite so strange, I guess. Like, being interested, really interested in philosophy and stuff like that is a bit more, like, mainstream, I guess. Would they have... Would they have jumped... Because it, it came to me in this book that the therapist has some quite stereotypical views about autism, which is a bit worrying. Because, you know, obviously, if you are stereotypical in some respects, like Tom Cutler, he's not stereotypical in all respects, you know, like, he does mask and stuff. But um, he does have some stereotypical interests. You know, whether if he wasn't so stereotypical... Um, on the interest front, would, would, would his therapist have come to the conclusion that he might be autistic? It makes me wonder. Um, so that shows how stereotypes can affect things. But his first reaction upon the therapist suggesting he might be autistic was, no, I've worked with Asperger's people and I've read about it. I'm not like that. I'm not a geek. He says, um, he says, you know, I've got a sense of irony. I get jokes. He says, that's not me. So, yes, yeah, so it actually shows how in other, res other respects he's not stereotypical. In my case, actually, I do meet that stereotype. I do get some jokes, but I do struggle with some jokes, and I'm not particularly great at irony. So, yeah, I guess it just shows that all autistics do meet at least some of the stereotypes. But in Tom's case, although his interest is stereotypical, he, he got jokes, and there were other things about him that aren't stereotypical. And then the, the therapist, um, and then the therapist said, <clears throat> You told me you have a degree in fine art. You could have been interested in classical sculpture or abstract expressionism. But no, your special interest is the design of British road signs. This is a very uncommon interest. Transport signs are systematic, and the autistic mind loves systems. So, yeah, the focus does seem to have a rather stereotypical view, because while it's true that many autistics do like those things, it's not true for all autistics. So, again, it made me wonder if she was confronted with some of less stereotypical interests, would she have, would she have considered autism, which is a little bit concerning. Actually, she might not have done. Um, so, yeah, so I'm going to move on to video number two now, to carry on uh, reviewing um, this book. So moving on to video number two now.